free to do so. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Susan Lightfoot Schempf. I'm the co-director of the Wallace Center. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am delighted to be joined by my colleague and teammate, Ellie Baumstein. And um, we are really grateful for all of y'all showing up today um, to learn more about the LAMP grants, but, but more specifically about how to get the word out about this opportunity. That's really the focus of this call is around out, outreach and education. Um, about the Farmers Market Promotion Program, Local Food Promotion Program, and Regional Food Systems Partnership Grants. Um, as y'all know, this is a pretty huge increase in funding this year. It's almost triple um, what last year's funding was, um, and that's due to, you know, increase in allocations, both in terms of appropriations um, and the stimulus bill. Um, so it was a lot of money to get channeled into communities. And um, a lot of folks don't know about this opportunity and this program. So it's really up to us as food systems and farming advocates um, to help get the word out and make sure that the communities that have been most impacted by the pandemic and also by the inequities in the food system are able to get um, these resources that are really needed right now. So Thank you for your partnership and trying to get the word out to those um, who want to apply for this opportunity. Um, our plan today is really to just give like a very high level overview of the opportunity um, and then really share with you some resources that the Wallace Center has developed to help get the word out. So we've created a communications and outreach toolkit that includes some social media um, stories, a lot of words that are, you know, different content, social media content and otherwise that you can use in your communications channels and share broadly. Um, and then we also wanted to just check with you about um, what kind of support might be meaningful to you and to others um, within our community to help increase access to this opportunity um, around technical assistance, application support, et cetera. Um, so we'll have a few minutes for that. And then also just really wanna encourage y'all to like unmute. We're all colleagues here. This isn't a presentation. We're just having a conversation and sharing information. And I know many of you are experts on this program as well. So share what you know um, so that we can all be better informed. Um, and I'll just share also just in all transparency that um, thankfully, the Wallace Center is getting a little bit of support from um, USDA AMS, um, so Agricultural Marketing Service, via a cooperative agreement with the University of Kentucky um, to be a part of this outreach and education effort, um, which is really exciting. It's not something that they have really done um, in the past in engaging networks and partners in this outreach and education around their grant opportunities. And they really wanted to prioritize that this year in particular, making sure that some of this extra fund, not some, the majority of this funding gets to underserved rural and black indigenous and other people of color communities um, that have been most impacted by the pandemic. Um, so that's really like the spirit in which we are, are doing this work and like I said, we have some resources to put towards the technical assistance. So we're hoping to get some guidance from you about what would be most meaningful um, for yourselves and your communities that you serve. Ellie, anything I missed just in terms of what we're, we're here to do today? I think that sounded great. All right. Um, so you wanna kick us off with just the high level overview of what the, the opportunity is? Sure. Uh, so I just put together a very uh, high level, really light on the details here, slideshow of what the programs that we're referring to today are. And hopefully um, some of you are familiar with this organization. Susan, is my screen share working? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so just really quickly here, the um, primary grant programs we're talking about today are the local food promotion program and the farmer's market promotion program. And a lot of times these are referred to as FMLFPP because they're kind of sister sister programs. Um, they are structured similarly, they are marketed similarly and usually are allocated the same amount of funding. Um, so the applications for these are due June 21st. You can apply to 
for up to $750,000. And that's an increase um, in previous years, it's only been 500. Um, and there's $38.5 million available in each of these programs. And just for reference, in 2020, $27 million was awarded for both of these. So we're talking about well over twice as much money in uh, FMLFPP this year. Both of these grant programs are split up into two different um, types of grants, planning and implementation for local food promotion program, and then capacity building or community development training and technical assistance for FMPP. And pay close attention to the RFAs on these because there's different amounts that you can apply for depending on if you're going for planning or implementation. Um, the LFPP is really focused on intermediated markets. So a lot of times projects that are related to food hubs, to processing, to institutional procurement, to value chain development, those are your LFPPs traditionally. Um, and the FMPP is really focused on supporting direct to consumer markets. So oftentimes it's CSAs and farmers markets that tend to um, apply for and win FMPPs. Um, so that's just really high level on those two. And then briefly as well, the third grant program that is covered um, is this regional food systems partnership. And this is actually only the second year that this grant program has existed. It was new in the most recent farm bill. And it's a really kind of exciting and creative approach that USDA is taking here. Uh, it's focused on supporting partnerships as opposed to just a single entity. And it's really meant to think about sort of systems and who are your allies and how can this grant program support really strengthening partnerships for local food systems development. This one, they're giving you a few more weeks to apply because that partnership development is so important. Um, and there are larger awards up to $1 million. Um, out of the 15.3 available. And similarly, these are broken into planning and design or implementation and expansion. Um, and just for reference, they awarded $9.3 million of these last year. Um, and now there's $15.3 million available this year. Uh, so again, this is super high level and there's a ton more detail about these programs in RFAs. And we're also gonna share a lot of other resources that you can take a look at to get a better sense of the parameters of these programs, really what they're for, and also just lots of rules and regulations and match requirements and that kind of stuff um, that we're not going to get in here today, but there's going to be lots of opportunity to learn more about that from us and from USDA. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ellie. Yeah. Um, curious if anybody just in talking about like kind of the bigger picture of these grants, is there anything that y'all might add from your perspective and your knowledge about these programs that you want your colleagues here to hear about? Don't be shy. You can also throw it into the chat box. I guess I have, or I am, I currently have an FMPP and a sub award under another, somebody else's FMPP. Um, and what I found with the LFPP and FMPP is the program officer, Kim Harmon, is one of the best program officers I've ever worked with. Like she has monthly check-in meetings. Like this particular, this particular program, they go out of their way to provide support networks for the grantees and learning opportunities. And so it's not just about accountability to how you're spending the funds they've given you. It's about creating a community of practice almost, although they don't call it that. But so I really like these programs in, in that sense. That's awesome. That's Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, that is great to hear. I did just want to toss out a couple um, other things that are different this year that I didn't mm -hmm. mention earlier. One is that for the first time ever, you can have, they're allowing current grantees to apply for um, the same grant in the same, like diff more grants in the same program. So if you're holding one of these grants right now, you can apply again this year, which wasn't the case in the past. Um, and they also increased the award amount for FMLFPP with the idea that higher capacity organizations that might be better positioned to take on a big USDA grant like this can then help 
funnel some of that money to smaller, lower capacity organizations. So those are two things that are different because of this COVID relief money um, that just kind of changed the, the game a little bit here this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll also share, um, I mean, we have a current um, local food promotion program grant and um, in hindsight, we wish that we had made ours simpler um, in terms of like the amount of activities and objectives, et cetera, that we included in our project. We were very ambitious. Um, and in the end, that USDA is not as flexible around changing your scope of work as we are accustomed to with more like, you know, private philanthropy and, and just working with foundations who have much more flexibility built into your programs. So that's something if you're in the, um, in the seat of grant writing or supporting folks that are looking to apply to really encourage people to keep it simple um, and reasonable. That's also something as we've been interfacing with the, um, the program officers and other grants management specialists at USDA, they are really hammering on that point of, of simplicity and, and being reasonable in terms of the scope and the size and scale of, of what um, applicants are proposing to do. Um, yeah, so thanks. I'm seeing some of these comments here, um, Kim, about you know, finding for the timeline to for startup, you should have buffered more time to get the back end support for the grant ready to go 100%. We've also had that experience. It took us probably five months to get the project up and rolling. Um, all of our financial management systems set up, project management systems, engaging partners, getting partners under contract all of those pieces. So that's another really important piece of, as you're you know, preparing your own proposals and helping others and preparing theirs to really think about like very realistically about time delays and such. Um, Julia, so you have your hand up. Do you wanna chime in? Yeah, um, maybe a comment to what you were just saying and then a question. So the comment is totally agree in terms of um, the both the complexity to keep the project simple. I, have, I currently have a farmer's market promotion program grant and wish we had made it more simple. And then the timeline too, that three years sounded like a really long time, but when the first year was spent really getting up and running and um, eat, there was a major player that shifted in within each of the organizations. So sort of rebuilding a project team between when we submitted the grant and when we started the grant and then there were fires and floods and a pandemic. And so it just three years disappeared. And we had been more realistic around the time management piece. Um, so that's just my comment. But my question was, if there's any known strategy around um, if these grants are now open for existing grantees to apply, like the sequencing, like would it make sense to go for a regional planning partnership grant and do like the planning one and then in the future the implementation or to do an FMPP and then a LFMP like is, is there any logic around the sequence of order of applying to these different programs or is it really around the best fit for each of your projects does that make sense yeah my sense would be it's more about the best fit um, and making sure that, and, and there actually is a decision tree that Ellie, I think we can share that. Um, and maybe we can stick that. Do you know which one I'm talking about? The decision tree that, okay, maybe we can stick it in the, um, in the Google drive that we're about to share with y'all. And we could go ahead and drop that, that Google link in here as well, cause we're about to get to this piece. Um, but what we've been told is that, um, it doesn't matter. Like if you have an existing LFPP and you want to apply for another LFPP because your program activities are most appropriately scoped to that grant program, you are, an, you are able to apply for an additional LFPP, but it's really important that the scope of work be completely different than your existing project. Um, and they're very concerned about having overlap um, and the potential of like doubling up on funding um, so it's going to be really important if you do apply for an additional grant, whether it is, you know, you have an FMPP now and you're going to go for an LFPP, that you have them be completely different projects, completely different objectives, 
Um, they may be complementary, and you can refer to your existing one, but you want to make it really explicit that the work that's going to be done, the hours that will be charged, and the match that will be included is completely distinct from your existing federal award. Um, they have been really concerned about that. I think also around RFSP, Ellie, you were a part of that Q&A yesterday. You want to reference like kind of the, the sequencing and appropriate activities for RFSP? Yeah, so, um, you know, USDA uses a lot of descriptive language that then is sort of up to interpretation. Um, and in terms of the difference here, like between the planning and design and the implementation and expansion, for example, um, the, the planning and design is much more around like feasibility studies and getting the right partners to the table and sort of newer partnership development was kind of how they described it compared to the implementation and expansion is maybe you like had the feasibility study done and are now ready to go and do the thing that's feasible. Uh, so it's definitely not black and white, but it's more about sort of the ripeness, at least in the RFSP of your project. Um, and, and really the key there seems to be displaying that you and the other partners have a solid working relationship. That seems to be the real crux of that program is they wanna accelerate partnerships that exist and take thing, things where people are kind of maybe working together and solidify those um, collaborations. Mm -hmm. Julia, does that answer your question? It does perfectly. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, I do want to point out, um, let's see, we have this question around from Jeremy about that being the right link. Yes, that is the appropriate landing page for the Regional Food Systems Partnerships um, grant. And the Wallace Center did a, um, a webinar a couple of weeks ago, um, led by our, our colleague um, Elizabeth around Regional Food Systems Partnerships. And it's really good. Um, so I really recommend if you're looking at that program to watch that webinar. There's some great insight from um, current grantees sharing the kinds of projects that they're doing. And also some insight from Renee Caracalos from Sustainable Ag and Food Systems Funders, who shared her perspective as a reviewer of the RFSP program last year and what she saw as like red flags or the kinds of projects that, sh that really stood out to her. Um, it's a really valuable webinar, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, and if you're looking at more sort of food systems wide work, um, whether you're, you know, or your partners are part of a food policy council doing like a food action plan, implementing a food action plan of any kind, coordinating with a number of different agencies at both the direct to consumer um, level and intermediated markets. Like if you're, if you're almost looking at like, is it FMPP or LFPP? We have so many people involved and it's more food systems wide. You really ought to be looking at regional food systems partnerships. Um, and that grant amount is larger, but like Ellie said, you need to have those relationships in place and be able to activate them pretty quickly. Um, although there is a little bit longer of a grant um, window in terms of the application window because they're due July 6th instead of J June 21st when the FMLFPP grants are due. Any other just like tips from those of you who have been involved with these programs um, or questions about the kind of higher level um, without getting into like the nitty gritty about the projects that you wanna to offer to colleagues here? And then we'll move on to talking about kind of communications and outreach. All right. Um, so I think Ellie dropped in the, the chat box a link to a Google Drive folder that our team um, put together. And I just want to really honor our colleagues, Annalena Kazikas and Michelle Matthew, who put this together in um, kind of record time. So this is the LAMP 2021 Grants Outreach um, folder. And if y'all um, open up the... Google Doc there, that's the communications campaign overview. You'll see in here that there's some great language that you can all steal from, just copy and paste into your own 
um, communications channels, there's social media um, tweets and Instagrams and all that kind of stuff that's available here. So just making it really easy for you to channel this information out to your communities um, and particularly looking for those organizations that maybe haven't ever tried to apply for this funding um, and really trying to provide them with support to do so. Um, just walking through this first document, um, just also wanna encourage y'all to like adapt the language to your organization's voice, um, but we have created some things that are just like ready to go. Um, so we don't have any like ownership of any of this language. We don't need any Wallace Center branding, whatever. This is meant for, for you to be able to use in your communities um, and using your organization's platforms to get the word out. Um, and I you know, wanna say that kind of, you know, in terms of our communications goals, really the idea of this whole campaign is getting the word out, but also really doing a big push for reviewers this year. Um, they, that USDA AMS has um, a portal through which people can apply to become a, a um, grant reviewer. You get paid a stipend of $700 to serve in that capacity. And it's really important that folks like us are on those review panels and that people who have lived experiences in building local and regional food systems, farmers, food business entrepreneurs, folks that really understand this work, that they're on those review panels. Um, because a lot of times it ends up being kind of industry associations and sort of folks that are sort of peripherally involved in local and regional food systems, but maybe don't really understand like the work that's being proposed. So it's really key that um, folks that understand this get there and particularly doing a push for um, those who have not been represented in review panels, particularly Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, um, to be sitting on those boards and helping to decide where this, this funding is being channeled. Ellie, anything else you wanted to say on the, the reviewers promotion? Just that it's sort of hard to overstate um, how important these reviewers are in the grant process. Um, they're sort of the first line of defense uh, in terms of, you know, judging whether or not these proposals are appropriate. And so having that food system lens, having a lens about why racial equity is so critical to the food system is really valuable in, in making those determinations. And the other piece of the puzzle is that then the next time you go to apply for one of these grants, you have a really strong sense of what goes into the decision-making processes and how these things are evaluated. So I've served as a reviewer before, and it was fun just to learn about what's going on in other people's communities, but also has been really valuable in, in us crafting um, proposals since then, just to, to understand how these decisions get made and sort of what the rubric that USDA uses um, when they're evaluating them. Yeah, and I see Stephanie's comment here about having been on the LFPP review panels for two rounds and it being a lot of fun, um, being able to see the different projects, like Ellie said, um, and also connecting with the other panelists, a great way to build relationship with other folks. Um, and yes, we can drop the, um, the link, Becky, into the, um, or sorry, Patty, into the, um, the chat box here for the reviewer. And I'll just note too that within this comms toolkit, um, there's links to like everything. <laughs> it's like the mother load of links. Um, so there's some informational webinars that USDA will be doing that you can promote through your um, communications channels and newsletters and such um, that are all coming up pretty quickly. I mean, this is a really tight turnaround. It's six weeks. And, and for those of y'all who have done these proposals, you know they are a bear. Um, it's a lot of work to put these together. So it's really important that folks start activating now um, to, and especially for that RFSP um, and getting partners on board. Um, it's time is of the essence. Um, Ellie, anything I'm missing here on the, the communications toolkit? There's some tiles. <laughs> We're learning what tiles are. We're doing some like <laughs> Instagram experimenting. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Ellie Brown. How does the USDA review multiple? So um, the way that USDA allocates the grants um, sort of by region and then gives them to a panel that is from a different region. Um, so just sort of, 
I always think that collaboration is better because you do get put into a pot with people in your same region, but then all of those get ranked individually and then kind of put back into the same big pool. Um, so it's not as though you're like directly competing against someone else in your mm. region. Um, but I would recommend just the more collaboration, the more communication, the more alignment that you have um, in your region is gonna, you know, be better overall. So it's, you know, I would say promote, 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 um, but also, you know, communication and collaboration is super valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to um, point out a couple of the other resources that are within this Google Drive um, that, you know, again, this is free for you to use. There's a um, stakeholder toolkit that the USDA had put out that also includes a lot of language. We've sort of made that more informal and approachable. So our communications toolkit is more like just like straight talk um, and trying to make it a little bit more accessible language. The USDA language is, is much more formalized, but there's still a lot of good information in there. Um, so you can also draw from that. There is a PowerPoint that the USDA team created that is like 32 slides that goes through all of the, the programs and it gets into the match distinctions this year, which is really complicated, frankly. Um, and so, you know, that'll be something to really pay attention to um, as you're applying and as you're helping others um, consider whether or not they want to apply. For the stimulus money, it has a 10% match, um, but the other, and, and also the appropriations, right? Or is the appropriations The appropriations 25%? is 25, yeah. See, it's, it's hard to keep straight. Um, and the 10% can be in-kind, the 25% is required cash match. Um, so there's some real distinctions there and you have to make a decision as to whether you're going to apply at 10% or at 25%. And you can't change that after the fact. Um, so I expect that there's going to be a lot of confusion and questions around that piece. Um, and we'll just do our best to continue to get information out to y'all as we get it um, around guidance for like, I mean, we've been asking ourselves, like, what's the more strategic choice? There's a bigger bucket of money under the 10% grants. Um, and it's likely that less organizations will apply at 25%. So I don't, it's almost like a prisoner's dilemma. <laughs> um, and, and we're not sure what the right move is, but you have to decide that for your own organization and in partnership with your, your colleagues. Um, and like Ellie said, there's some um, Instagram posts and tiles in here that you can just um, do a thunderclap or just you know push them out um, and ask your colleagues to share them widely. And we, we didn't put any branding on those because we just wanted everybody to use them. So any questions about this communications toolkit, um, anything that we've provided here, and then we'll look at the, the questions in the chat box and just open it up for, for other questions too. Another thing that sprang to mind also is that if there's a communications item that you think would be helpful, uh, let us know and we're happy to scramble things or write something that's a different length or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, come up with any other little tools that that might be helpful depending on who your audience is. Um, hey, Jeremy, I see your question here um, around for approved grantees, can you pay out of funding for grant writing? I'm um, understanding your question to be like, if you were approved a grant, could you then pay for the grant writing? Um, I think there was a question that came up about this yesterday, right, Ellie? Yeah, and the it's, answer was uh, very inconclusive. Um, they said that I think you can write this in as a pre-expense, but they're very, it's very rare that they award um, awards with pre-expenses in them. And uh, there's also the chance that you don't win the grant and then 
I have to figure out how to pay for that in another way. So mm. I will tell you though, that USDA does have um, a couple email addresses that they've set up to field those more technical questions. Um, we have you know, enough knowledge to be dangerous, but I'm certainly not as well versed in this as a USDA grant specialist. So I can f um, fish out those USDA email addresses and they're really kind of crashing these grants right now because they know that they're just gonna need a lot of resources to answer everyone's questions. Um, so that's the kind of thing that might be better to send to USDA so that we don't give you um, an answer that's not 100% accurate. Yeah. And in terms of that second question um, about, his, Jeremy's asking if the grants are yearly, um, meaning being used within the calendar year. Um, I only know from my own, our own experience of managing an LFPP right now, and the year is actually October 1 to September 30th. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case on the FMPPs. I think it depends on when they're able to actually get the awards out the door. And then that becomes the year. Um, I know this last year, they were trying really hard to get the funds out before the appropriations bill closed. So that's why all of ours were like, I think we got our awards or like the award notifications in September and they had to turn them around really fast because they were trying to spend down all the appropriations from the previous fiscal year. Um, so there's some complexities in terms of the timing. Um, I see Kim saying the same for FMPP and that, that might've been for these, the fiscal year 20, um, yeah, federal fiscal year. There is some amount of this money that isn't time bound, and I think it might be from the first COVID relief bill. Um, so USDA is not, they never guarantee that they're going to spend all of the money that's appropriated for these programs. Um, and they haven't promised, yes, 100% chance we're going to spend $38.5 million in each of these and then, the, you know, 15 and a half. So they, it's up to their discretion for some of the money and then some of it has to get spent. And I can't remember exactly which pot is which, um, but it's, yeah, it's up to their discretion to decide how much they want to allocate. Mm -hmm. And then I also just wanted to be sure that um, they're, they're three-year grant programs as well. So when you apply, it's for a, up to three-year long project. Isn't there an extension to some of them being four years this year? Or am I making that up? I don't know. Oh, I might, I need to follow up on that. Don't quote me. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I feel like I probably would have gotten excited yeah. about that. So I don't, I don't know. Um, okay, so a question from Rafaela, um, supporting grant writing for a network of food pantries and soup kitchens. Would projects like mobile markets and deliver be, delivery be eligible for these grants? Yes, but it depends on what you put as project expenses. You cannot buy food um, with the funding from these programs. Um, so there are some in each of the requests for applications for each of the programs, there's a list of ineligible um, act, like activities or um, costs associated with each of them. Be sure to look at those really carefully um, to make sure that you're not incorporating those into your programming. But otherwise, like for the, the program themselves or like the project work that you're wanting to do, um, certainly there's plenty of mobile markets and, and delivery projects that are um, part of these programs or that are supported by these programs. Um, I want to quickly just see, Ellie, if there's, I know there's a lot of questions coming in. We could also kind of hang out for um, a few minutes after the, you know, because we were planning on this being 45 minutes um, for Q&A, but I want to just kind of transition quickly to a discussion around um, technical assistance for applicants. Um, our team at the Wallace Center has been putting together some ideas in addition to the kind of outreach and education push that we're doing right now to just get the word out about the opportunity and to try and get folks to sign up to be reviewers. Um, we're also going to be kind of shifting into more of a technical assistance and support phase in about a week or so. Um, and we're wondering what y'all think would be most helpful. Um, around that. So, so really being able to provide meaningful support to potential applicants. Um, one of the things that we're lining up is to um, engage a network of funders 
Um, so the Sustainable Ag and Food Systems Funders Network, we're a member of that. And we were going to reach out to see if there's volunteers who would do reviews of proposals and just give feedback on drafts. Um, so that's one thing that we were um, aiming to do and also maybe hosting some office hours where we could just talk with potential applicants about their concepts um, and be able to just ask questions and help folks to just like refine what it is that they're, they're thinking about doing. And in previous years, we've created peer review processes where we could match um, applicants with one another to be able to review one another's proposals. Um, so those are a couple of the ideas that we have in the mix. And I'm wondering if y'all have any ideas or suggestions of how the Wallace Center could provide meaningful technical assistance over the next six weeks um, as you, and, and, and particularly for the organizations that are lower capacity um, and haven't gotten access to these funding resources before, like what do you think would be most helpful? That's one idea around um, like, a Google Doc with just the like a template where you can be writing in your narrative and and your work plans for each of the three proposals. Because I know with my FMPP grant, just figuring out how to um, it took me to the end of the proposal and the night before where I was like, oh, there's no introduction section. Like there was no yeah. place where you write an abstract, and mm -hmm. I sort of kept on waiting. Um, or I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was just like, it was such a unique format that I didn't really like get my head around the format and how I should structure my proposal until like, you know, hours before it was due. And then um, subsequently other colleagues have used the template that I created and have also won awards using that same template. And it was like, oh, it, well, it would have been a lot easier if someone else had figured that magic out for me. Um, so that seems like something like the, sort of the skeleton of the proposal. Yeah, thank you. That's a great idea. And like small things that we oftentimes take for granted um, as organizations that have gone through these rounds multiple times, like Wallace Center has a template that we used as well. So um, that's a great idea, Julia, thank you. And a budget template would also, I think, fit in that, like a, a narrative template and then a budget template. Yeah. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, I just wanna check the chat box here. Um, yeah, thanks, Emily. I will definitely try and incorporate that feedback on proposals. Um, Ellie, I see your point about applications of winning grants in the past. Um, I think that we have access to some, but that was like the one thing that the USDA said that we couldn't share. They're very <sighs> tight-lipped about those. They have created, um, USDA has done some nice communications tools around some projects um, that have been successful in the past. And I'm happy to share that just to give you a sense of like the type of program that they are really interested in supporting. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they'll <clears throat> share grant applications. I think that's like proprietary information. Um, Jeremy, I'm seeing your your question here. Um, I think maybe if you want to hang out for a few minutes afterwards, we could talk directly about um, applying for the two um, proposals in two different areas. Um, yeah, a list of grant writers too. I think that that's something that we could probably crowdsource. Um, you all might have some suggestions of that, and we could put that within this comms toolkit as well um, and make that available through the Food Systems Leadership Network mm -hmm. as well. So um, we'll follow up on that kind of with an ask to the network for people, for names. And I think we all know that the value of having someone who has food systems expertise serving in that role as grant writer. Um, I know we've had some challenges before of working with proposal writers who don't have like share the framework of what we're trying to accomplish. And that can be a real hurdle for folks. So, um, you know, would ask that as you add people there that they are folks who like get it. 
Um, yes, Stephanie, seeing your point here about peer review and technical assistance feedback, um, those outcomes, the metrics within these um, applications are really difficult to deal with. And I mean, on the bright side, next year, there's going to be a new set of metrics. Um, but unfortunately, they weren't done in time for this year's program. Um, so we're all going to be subject to the this currently very clunky metrics. Um, oh, yeah, but that part's really difficult. Mm -hmm. In particular, the one about um, showing an increase in sales of local food it like how do you get all those different farmers to tell you if their sales are increasing or not like i don't know yeah yep heard stephanie we have definitely i think probably everybody saw some some faces nodding on that one that one's really challenging um patty you got your hand up Yes, I don't even know if I know how to ask my question. Um, I facilitate a network in West Virginia, a value chain, and we were talking about um, the regional planning grant today, and we have no experience. Well, we have very limited experience applying for a grant for multiple partners in our network. And I'm wondering if you have any guidance on that. Like even approaching the subject is curious because normally people are competing in secret. Mm. And um, we're, we, we didn't you know, give up on it just the meeting ended, but we really could use some guidance if anybody has any on how to engage partners and they work collaboratively anyway, but into collectively you know, they, that we're a collective and a collaborative. If you have any guidance or hints or process around that, I could really use some of any of it. Yeah, that is a great point, Patty. Um, and I think there are a lot of best practices um, out there around more collaborative proposal development and like participatory budgeting and some strategies around like, you know, arriving at a shared understanding around the project and such that maybe would be a kind of office hours that, that we could host would be specifically on that. Because the other thing I, I, I did want to mention is that we um, at Wallace Center, I think we're going to focus mostly of our tech, bleh, sorry, most of our technical assistance around the Regional Food Systems Partnership program, because that's the one that has the least resources around it right now and, the, and um, is newer. Um, and there's a significant amount of new funding there that we want to make sure gets out the door. So we'll, we'll circle back to you, Patty, on that and others. Um, cause I think that's the kind of conversation that we could probably host and, and lean on the network too, on different best practices and ideas. All right. Well, I know we're, we're right at time and folks probably want to get their, um, next on to their next zoom call. <laughs> so we jump from zoom to zoom, but if anybody wants to hang out, um, and ask other questions, I know Jeremy, you had had one, um, about some, the project you're working on. So if y'all just want to Anybody that wants to keep talking, please do. Otherwise, um, you are, you're free to roll on to your next thing. Please um, help get the word out, particularly, you know, there's so many smaller organizations that have not ever tried to go for this funding before. And this is going to be the best, the best bet, um, at least, you know, this year, the best time for them to try and go for it. Um, rural communities, underserved communities, Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color, um, the reviewers are going to be specifically looking out for proposals from those organizations. And then also, if your organization is in a position to apply on behalf and in partnership with smaller organizations that don't have the capacity to manage a federal grant, should really consider serving in that kind of intermediary role or as a lead or a prime on a proposal and help get some of this funding out to organizations that otherwise really wouldn't be able to um, maybe manage a grant of this kind. So thanks all. Ellie, any other kind of parting words? Apply to be a reviewer. <laughs> yeah, apply to be a reviewer. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks, Have a great everybody. day. Thank you.